Before you start this episode, this is just a reminder that History Hack does have a Patreon account and a Ko-fi account as well. You can either register to subscribe and throw us a few quid every month, or simply buy us enough caffeine to continue through to the next episode. Because frankly, we run on fumes most of the time. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm joined by the lovely Nina. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thank you. Spring seems to finally be creeping in here on the other side of the pond, which is good. And, uh, you know, life is life is rollicking along as it usually does, assorted projects. But of course, I absolutely could not miss this one. Uh, and uh, looking forward very much to moving on. So uh, let me just jump right in and say that today on History Hack, we're joined by watchmaker and historian Rebecca Struthers, who's here to talk to us about her debut book, Hands of Time, A Watchmaker's History of Time. Welcome, Rebecca. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is, this has been a really interesting subject. I was quite surprised when this one landed on my desk. And um, you, you cover quite a large area of time as well. You go all the way back to um, the, sort of the, the prehistory. So um, it's hard to think what what they would have used as timepieces. So, so what were the earliest forms of timepiece? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, this book took me um, so many different directions outside of my normal remit. From, yeah, very much trained as a watchmaker, which is the last 500 years or so. But um, to get to the root of it, it kind of it naturally led right the way back to how we discovered the cyclic nature of time itself. And um, I mean, a lot of the ways that we discovered that would have been through the similar sort of things that we can look out of our windows or go out into our natural surroundings and observe today. So, um, I mean, some of the methods we would likely have started using would be things like migrating animals, um, celestial observation as well, so uh, lunar phases, um, and also the, the behaviour of animals around us like roosters to this day. We can kind of, we know when the dawn is arriving by uh, the cockerel crowing. And these are the sort of events that have been, existed for tens of thousands of years. So the first um, possible timekeepers that were actually our way of, of annotating this, measuring it, of taking a note of it, um, are likely to be bone carvings. And uh, the oldest possible calendar out of those dates back to over 40,000 years old, and that's the Lobombo bone. Um, and that was found in the uh, Lobombo Mountains on the um, South African border. And um, it's a it's a tiny, it's about the size of uh, your little finger, so it's a tiny little bone, but um, it's a series of notches and spaces that when counted and evened out, work out to a roughly a lunar calendar. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that's kind of probably how we started. But obviously things of this age don't come with an instruction manual. So we're left kind of guessing to an extent. Um, certainly by the time it gets sort of 20, 30,000 years ago, we get more, more bone carving start to appear. And um, the Ishango bone and Blanchard bone packs being another two possible lunar calendars, um, which, yeah, although we can't prove anything for certain, um, things don't tend to appear out of nowhere. And by the time we get sort of 5,000 years ago and we start looking at um, shadow clocks, you know, they, they're not going to appear just from nowhere. We must have had a build up to that. So it would make sense for these sort of astronomical observations to have been going on in the run up to that. It's fascinating to me that um, we, we were so deeply embedded in nature during that period um, that, you know, that we're, to hand, you know, taking what's to hand and trying to make sense of what we're experiencing and seeing. And of course, you know, if you're a hunter gatherer, uh, you know, you, you move with the game and, you know, there are so many different reasons why you have to have a sense of time, even if it's essentially seasonal time, as opposed to, you know, where we are now, where, you know, we're at millisecond time <laughs> but um yeah. but I found it I found it fascinating throughout the the first portion of your book Rebecca how much nature and natural materials um play a huge role in in our beginning to understand and then perhaps try to try to manage time and you um you commented at one point in your introduction watches don't create time they measure our cultural perception of time and so I was fascinated yeah. how you explored early on the role of nature and natural materials in helping early humans and then, you know, sort of pre-Christian era humans um, understand 
and manage how they ran their days or weeks or months. So. Yeah, I mean, it's fundamental to the development of civilizations is um, things like the mastery of agriculture and right. the mastery of agriculture is the mastery of understanding seasonal change. Right. Um, and so, you know, for civilizations, you need to be able to make a lot of food. <laughs> so, exactly. um, yeah, it's key to our development. Yeah, and being and being able to anticipate certain things, as, mm. as you pointed out, you know, as we focus on agriculture, as we move from being hunter gatherers, where we did need to have a sense of time, you know, when will the game be here? Is it here at the same part of the season? Are there ways we can anticipate or make sure that we get enough food to last through a period when we know we are not going to be able to get food? But that as you become more agriculture focused and you become more stationary then you have to be able to and you begin to learn that if you plant stuff it grows then you have to then you have to be able to anticipate in a way that becomes more sophisticated over time and so that those sorts of relationships were were a particularly interesting um aspect of the early part of the book i found absolutely i mean the uh the ancient Egyptians are the ones credited with discovering the solar year, 365 a year, around 5,000 years ago. Mm. And that was linked to the flooding of the Nile that occurs at the same time every year when Sirius appears in the night sky. Mm. So, again, the, the flooding is uh, and water, um, a key really? ingredient for <laughs> the cultivation of plants. Um, yeah. I don't want to get too far afield, but um, just yeah. which which we can return to later is as now with um, changes in climate as our seasons are being disrupted as our weather is being disrupted uh, clearly one of the things that human beings are going to have to begin to understand is those shifts that the, you know the the planting year the season for growing the season for hunting you know in mm. much of the world is still not highly industrialized and you know, so many people are still very reliant on growing seasons and particular climates and so on and because that's changing rapidly it will be I think on the one hand I'm sure it's unnerving for people but also interesting to see what are we going to do to to uh, adapt to these yeah. years of time and and our role related to time Definitely. I mean, I find this fascinating and also slightly disconcerting of yes. kind of our future relationship with time because we have evolved alongside the earth as the way it is and it, things are changing very quickly now. Um, and this is something I found, I mean, not just with the development of watches and our understanding of time, things move quite slowly and as time goes on, as we get more closer and closer towards the modern era, everything speeds up, right. our lives speed up, technology speeds up. Um, and climate change is speeding up as well and those two things coming together the changes of things like seasonal change when we've evolved to work in a certain way right how you know the, how we're going to respond to that and the the speeding up of technology as well um is that of course we've evolved to live around earth time um and as we start to travel further afield um that's going to change as well because so obviously earth time is not relevant anywhere else in the universe no. So we've got a lot of changes coming in our relationship with time. Yeah. We, we certainly do. Mm. Uh, you you had just mentioned the Egyptians as being um really the first people that we know of who were able to consider time and that it was related to the flooding of the Nile. So I know that um you know a lot of a lot of things that come to the western world that are time related are coming from ancient china are coming from the islamic world what can you tell us about developments in terms of time and how time was being registered and counted or recorded through various means and instruments during uh, during that period so i think time our understanding of time starts with these kind of larger events that are going on around us and our understanding of them so we can live our lives better by them but as we advance that understanding we start to divide what we're observing around us into smaller and smaller more manageable parcels um and this is where the development starts to get really interesting from kind of a timekeeping uh, measurement perspective there's where we had um, very natural timekeepers so everything from our bone carvings through to sundials and clepsydra 
which is a really important development, those are water clocks. Um, mm -hmm. Using a, a natural substance like water, passing from one vessel to another and measuring it almost like an interval timing um, to measure the passage of time, we start to develop mechanical means to um, kind of incorporate alongside that and that's when things start to get more and more accurate mm -hmm. um, and this is something really I mean, during the Islamic golden age where you had um, huge sponsors I suppose it was the financial sponsorship of, right. of innovation and technology so you had the Caliph Harun Har al-Rashid who um, started the golden age by kind of financing the greatest minds of the Islamic world to push the boundaries of technology and innovation. Um, and the first, well, one of these first early kind of, they started up in water powered mechanical clocks. And this is a sort of hybrid you get before we go fully mechanical. Um, one of the first ones there's any record of this from the year eight, uh, 802. And it was a, sent as a gift to Charlemagne, mm. um, accompanied by an Asian elephant, was a uh, brass water clock that um, could also sound out the hours. Um, oh, and unfortunately, a lot of these things haven't survived the test of time, so we just have these descriptions. But it's an incredible sounding device. And, um, yeah, it really links this. I mean, education and knowledge is, is a luxury, ultimately. I mean, we take it for granted today that... Uh, we have the time we go to school and we learn we learn we can learn um but you go back sort of a thousand fifteen hundred years and beyond um having the ability to learn things beyond keeping yourself fed and alive was was a, a true luxury and to be able to show off um these wonderful innovations was a way of showing you know we really are at the forefront of of technology we are at the forefront of science and we have the greatest minds and the greatest investment and um yeah it was a big kind of it was there was a lot of prestige and one-upmanship <laughs> between various kings and emperors showing off who has the very best scientists and innovators so you had that i mean there were um Al Zakali, who was another innovator, who um, he was in Spain and created um, a wonderful water clock in Toledo that um, could show celestial indication. Um, it, the, there was a vessel of water that would slowly fill and empty over the course of the month to mirror the waxing and waning of the moon. Um, and one of the most amazing parts of it is that it could um, also correct. So if you took water out, it would also refill to the level it was supposed to be at which um, can we think of autocorrecting as being kind of a modern construct, but this is something in the 11th century that had already been pioneered. Um, so you have this going on um, in Europe and the Islamic world. And equally over um, further field in China, you had the likes of Su Song, who um, was in the Henan province of China and um, made, he was commissioned to make, again, you've got the wealthy benefactors of, of these innovators, um, were commissioned to make uh, by the Emperor of China the most um, complicated, most glorious clock in the world. And that's in 1088. And again, this had our millery spheres, celestial indication, automata, the little people that would move, robotic people. Um, and what was arguably the most remarkable part of this from the watchmaker's perspective is that um, although it was powered by water, it had the first of what we call an escapement. And this is a mechanical means to control the release of power from the water. So it's water drive, gravity um, causes a series of buckets on a wheel, like a water wheel to turn. And the escapement was uh, a couple of steel yards weighted that would swing and grab and release this wheel, allowing it to turn one bucket at a time incrementally and um, arguably was the first tick tock the clock ever made in history so again something we take for granted now is um, pioneered so long ago and yeah it's still I mean that that principle of the season release of power within a watch is something that's still used in every mechanical watch to this day the clock yeah, I, I was astonished when I was reading that portion of your book at how early these things occur, how early uh, human innovation comes up with well before what we consider, you know, the real mm -hmm. mechanical age comes up with ways to sort of quantify, count and keep track of time in, in a startlingly sophisticated manner. So I, I learned, a, I was um, 
quite astonished at how, how, how early it was. Chris, you probably were too at the, you know, the early, the, the, how early uh, this kind of, um, you know, semi-mechanical keeping track of time actually occurs. Uh, absolutely. Especially when you compare it to 1080 in this country, we just yeah. had the Norman conquest. Yeah. They're building the tower of London and every, and everyone's really quite poor. And yet in China, they're developing this amazing piece of kit that can tell the time. <laughs> We're building a giant yeah. castle. <laughs> <laughs> Such an amazing disparity between the two cultures. Skipping ahead a little bit, uh, but staying on in, in England. Wow. Well, England's uh, Britain. Um, what was the story of Queen, um, Mary Queen of Scots' watch, because that was quite fascinating. Yeah, see, I, again, I love these sort of stories. It's the mystery and intrigue around them as much as it is the object. So um, from archival writings at the time, Mary Queen of Scots um, was given a watch in the form of a skull by um, her future husband, then husband, Francis. And um, this, these they were called form watches because they are, quite literally in the form of something. And they were incredibly popular towards the end of the 16th and early 17th centuries. Um, and they could be anything from flowers or animals. You get little hairs. Um, there's a beautiful snail um, at the British Museum uh, to crucifixes and Bibles. And skulls was a really, really popular theme. Um, obviously, there's a lot of symbolism in, in the shape of a human skull. Literally, like with eye sockets, you'd read the time by snapping the jaw open and there'd be a little dial hidden inside the roof of the mouth um a lot of symbolism a lot of importance particularly within the catholic faith and um mary was reported to have one of these skull watches and um yeah it's one of those things that over the years there must have been about 100 different skull watches <laughs> that were mary queen of scots there's one in the collection of the clockmakers company in london um, that now is um, fairly certainly believed to be an amalgamation that's put together at a slightly later date. Um, but remarkably, it's still uh, one of, if not the most popular watch in their collection, despite the fact it's not quite what it purports to be. So it's a perfect case of not letting the truth get in the way of a good story, <laughs> which you get time and time again with watches. Everything, Everyone wants something that belongs to someone famous. Yes, it, it has that sort of celebrity aspect. Yeah, I was I was intrigued by um, first of all that you know the the fact that at this point um, watchmakers and and uh, the technology has moved ahead so that you can now instead of having to use huge buckets full of water, mm-hmm. although you'd mentioned that there was already an escape route, that now uh, skills and ability to manipulate materials and so on has coalesced in something that you could actually hold in your hand and yeah. it would tell you the t- the time basically um and and as you pointed out the connection between you know death and time tempest fugit you know mm. all sort of cultural aspects how people thought about time and time on earth and uh, earth time versus time in heaven and all of those things appear to come to play with with that object whether or not it was in fact mary queen of scots uh herself but the high style object and the messages encoded in in something that at least suggests to you that you you are in control of time but are you really so anyway that was the i i, I love that story that was a particular a particularly interesting one. So by the 17th century, by the 17th century, again, um, you know, uh, uh, as reading reading through your book and uh, you, you do such a wonderful job of um, keeping the reader up to date with developments in technology at the same time as you're talking about shifts in culture in terms of understanding of time. So um We've we've talked a little bit about about Mary Queen of Scots watch. What did watches of the of the late seventeenth century? What can we sort of learn about the people who actually were purchasing them? I assume at this point they're still one offs and they're still expensive luxury items. Is that do I have that correct? Yeah. So I mean, the first watch was invented in around the year fifteen hundred and as you say that was kind of the the progression of technology from these water powered mechanical clocks through to fully mechanical clocks um that shrank down and down and down over a few hundred years to so something yeah, you could hold in the palm of your hand. Um 
but in obviously we're long before industrialization now so the only way you could develop skills to make a watch would be spending the best part of 10 years mastering your skills and then they were, took a very long time to make so they're hugely hugely expensive things and um ironically were not very accurate either for a long time in the, in the first few hundred years of their existence um it's not until 1675 that we introduced something called the hairspring Mm-hmm. um that you get this sudden leap in the accuracy of watches um and before that point i mean even so looking at mary queen of scots watches watches that era some of them would have sundials with them so <laughs> so you could correct your watch based on the position of the sun um it again was very much uh, watches have always been status symbols of one kind or another and that's one of the wonderful things you can see in portrait art at the time people would be painted with their watches like you get a celebrity with the the flash watch on their wrist now in photographs and magazines um so again same sort of thing again kind of knowledge was a prestige it was luxury it was status and to show that you had both the, the capital to be able to buy this really high-end piece of technology, even if it wasn't that accurate, but also that you understood it and, and you knew what the mechanics of this thing were and showed that you, your knowledge of science, technology and the arts, um, you know, it's a, a huge sort of status symbol, as much so then as it is now. And um, even by the late 17th century, so now we've got the hairspring and things to get more accurate, Um they're still hugely valuable things. And I mean, really, right the way up until industrialization and um, towards the end of the 19th century, when you get the advent of the dollar watch, watches are, are pretty expensive. So it's only a small portion of the population that can access them. It does seem to be shifts in technology that begin to derive, uh, no pun intended, um, watch development. Just remind us, because I had to, I had to uh, recall myself what um, what a hairspring does. Just quickly for the for the listening uh, for our listeners. Sure. So you've got the escapement, which is the bit that catches and releases the power in the watch. And by this point, we were working with an escapement called the verge, which was a couple of flags. And each flag will catch and release the tooth of a wheel. So it starts, stop, start, stop. And this start, stop will create the right speed of rotation to turn the hands. Um, and that uh, start, stop, that catch, release is triggered by oscillation of something. So that's the either swinging back and forth, rotating, pivoting back and forth. Um, and in this case, of, of something we call the balance wheel. So to pivot back and forth at a nice regular rate, you need something to control that oscillation. And the perfect thing to do that is a spring. So you get the hair spring is like a spiral shaped spring, spring that um, the movement, we call it breathing. So it kind of undercoils, so it goes too tight and overcoils outwards. So it's too loose then pulls itself back in again to go too tight. And because it's attached to the balance um, at the middle, that swings the balance one way and then back the other way and back on itself again, creating that all-important oscillation. And the spring was the thing that evened this out. So before that, it was just relied on the energy that was running through the escapement, kicking back at the balance. But at this point, we actually have something to regulate that back and forth, to and fro movement, and and create something that vaguely resembles an accurate timekeeper. (laughs) Thank you. That's that's a very clear and very helpful explanation for those of us who are not as mechanical as, as some of them. I, I, I've just I've come up with the most awkward segue. Are you ready for this? Go for it. OK, so 19th century ship design. Bear with me. 19th century ship design um, is very similar to the early watches in the um, having the sundial as a backup. Um, they weren't ready to move away from to just immediately to coal fired engines. They had sails as well, which leads me ne- neatly to the next question, which was about the Royal Navy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dear, told you, told you this was awkward. <laughs> Naval historians were all awkward. Um, so, uh, but watches had quite an important role in the uh, Royal Navy's just um, work with latitude, didn't it? Yes, uh, with the longitude problem. Um, so this I knew I was... get the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> They do, they do sound similar. Um, so calculating our uh, latitude when we're travelling, so that's our distance north or south of the equator, is fairly easy to calculate based on the position of the sun. 
But longitude, which is our east-west position, so that's the kind of imaginary lines that go between the North and South Pole, um, is much more challenging. And um, there have historically been ways to do it, including things like using dead reckoning, which is literally knowing what direction you're heading in and how quickly you're traveling to figure out where you are on the map. Um, celestial navigation using the sextant um, is another way but that relies on having good enough weather to be able to take regular measurements um, and then beyond that you're kind of in the vast expanse of nothingness in the seas and oceans with no visual reference or cue to go by um, so if you're stuck in bad weather for any length of time um, it's very easy to get yourself lost and that was not an uncommon thing to happen mm. um, which obviously aside from the dangers of, of getting lost at sea and having restricted supplies, um, you've got the risk of ending up in the wrong place and, and hitting a reef or rocks, which is what happened um, in the early 18th century and caused the biggest loss of life, I think, to this day um, in peacetime naval history. Um, so, yeah, there, there was a real push to, they call it the longitude on the longitude prize um, that they came up with to... Uh, boost innovation in finding a way to solve this problem so that it could accurately plot where we are whilst out at sea. And um, although initially it wasn't believed that a watch or clock could ever be accurate enough to do that, the solution did indeed come in the form of um, kind of like an oversized pocket watch. Um, it was John Harrison initially tried several clocks to solve the problem before settling on this kind of giant pocket watch that now lives in uh, Greenwich at the Royal Observatory. Um, and this would help people um, plot their position by recording the time of their home port, um, then from the, the position of the sun where they were out in the middle of the ocean, wherever they were, they could uh, record their local time and then compare that to the home port time to figure out how many degrees east or west they travel as their, their um, origin. So this was hugely, hugely successful um, and paved the way really for yeah, complete transformation in how we tell the, the time at sea, or in the west at least. So obviously the Polynesians had been doing this for a very long time with great success previously, but it was kind of um, I suppose where we started telling time with, through natural means in the West, we've become so disconnected from that that we could no longer do it without the assistance of machine supporters, where in other parts of the world they, they haven't had the, that issue. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it changed the face of, of maritime history, although it's, um, it did take a while to catch on in full the first time people could be a little inaccurate. And I do go a little bit of detail into this in my book, um, I mean, they had technical issues. Obviously, you've got huge changes in temperature. You've got salty sea air and nothing ferrous like salty uh, water. Um, and I do ingest that it is true that uh, ship's cats were um, the cause of several casualties amongst their timekeepers. Because <laughs> uh, as anyone, I have two cats myself. And as anyone with cats knows, they can be very mischievous. And they used to like trying to play with the ticking moving things that um, lived on ships so yeah <laughs> <laughs> he did by nature yet again human beings you know <laughs> yeah. in, the form of, in the form of cats yeah <laughs> i'm sure a lot of our listeners will find will uh will, will find that that resonates with their own lives in terms of the roles of cats and assorted mechanical things or things you're trying to accomplish uh but yes that was a that was a particularly enjoyable part of <laughs> of your book was all of the efforts to put these large accurate timepieces to seal them in boxes to keep them from getting jostled or dropped or to try to keep them from rusting and you get defeated because if you don't lock the box properly the cat decides it's going to get in and play with the hands or yeah. you, you jam the key in and it breaks and then you can't get to it <laughs> You know. yeah. Or if you do lock the box properly and then the person with the key gets off the ship and you sail off and you realise you've forgotten the keys. And there you are. Yeah. Age exactly. old human problems. <laughs> so many, so many human problems with that. But uh Chris, because you're a naval historian, um once uh -huh. <laughs> Once this was adopted, um, I assume that, you know, that as as Rebecca has pointed out, is that this this revolutionizes sea travel, it revolutionizes shipping, 
not just the Navy, but also I assume mercantile shipping. So that um, is that I, I'm going to stop blathering because this is your area. So do you want to add to um, add to or respond to, to Rebecca's observations about this? I would imagine this was just a huge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it has has a massive effect on um, on especially for Britain at the time being a a, a maritime empire because we're because we're covered over such a large area and shipping is so important to us not just for commerce but for the for the navy and during sort of that the mid to late 19th century you've got all the uh, disco- uh discovery voyages because we're at peace so there's so much navigation going on that uh, anything that helps like this is just an absolute godsend i mean we we, we did the franklin expedition didn't we and um not we, me and Nina didn't go on the Franklin expedition, although I feel like it some days. Um, but we, we, we did a podcast on it recently and, uh, that would have been absolutely fundamental to the navigation and um, plotting routes around the Northwest Passage mm-hmm. to try and work out where they were. They had officers who were assigned specifically for, uh, measurements of that sort of thing, especially when the compass starts to go haywire because they're too far north. But so, um, tell us, tell us more about the, the watchmakers themselves, because as you said, it's quite a, um, quite a skillful, was an enormously skillful um job so um they would have been they would have been a really quite talented people i mean at the high end of the market um I mean, it's like many professions you get kind of your elite of the market and then you get the bulk of the people working around them um and at that kind of high end of things a traditional watchmaking apprenticeship lasts for about seven years um you'd be indentured then you'd Past to become a journeyman for another two, three years before you become a master yourself. So it was, yeah, about a 10 year process. Um, and that was kind of very much customary amongst your high end London makers. John Harrison's an interesting character because he never served a, a formal apprenticeship. He was a carpenter from uh, Lancashire. So no one, yeah, there's less known about his very early history. Um, but he, when he moved to London, ended up, um, friendly with and supported by um, one of the greatest clockmakers of his day, a man called George Graham, who was more of a sort of formal apprenticeship, and he was very highly regarded um, and managed to get John in with the right circles and in front of the king, and that hugely, hugely helped him with um, uh, being taken seriously as a contender for the Longitude Prize. Uh, one of my favourite watchmakers of the day is a chap called um, Thomas Mudge. And he, um, again, creatives, you get all different kinds of people. So you get these people who are out there, they, they're quite happy putting their name to things, they're quite happy being in the forefront and um, being heard about. And then you get uh, people like Thomas Mudge, who was this incredible inventor. Um, he invented a form of escapement that's still used um, in virtually every mechanical watch to this, to this day. And he spent the first part of his career working in almost total obscurity. Um, he made incredibly complicated watches, a perpetual calendar, which is kind of calendars that can um, keep accurately uh, accounting the months, depending on uh, months, months of varying length over years. Um, but other watchmakers, and it was actually ended up, um, it was only when one of his watches broke that had been retailed by another watchmaker that that other watchmaker couldn't repair it and it had to go back to him. But he was unearthed as this genius behind right. um, all these all these other complications. And it was at that point that his name got out there and he, he became an entity in himself. It's like he came out of the shadows and there's this reluctant genius. <laughs> I suppose to take credit for for his work, and yeah, had he been um, a bit faster, uh, there's every chance he could have won the longitude prize. But he was a few years after Harrison and his his work with the Lever Escapement. So yeah, you get this contrast, but at the same time, you get outside of London, um, where you get the clockmakers' company kind of holding the reins over them. Um, And you have a huge number of brilliantly talented craftspeople who are working in different ways, not serving necessarily formal apprenticeships, which could be very expensive too. So they were um, highly exclusionary. Um, And you go out to places like um, Lancashire and places around Prescott, where you had people who could barely read or write, who were making incredible works of art, of, of parts quite often. Um, that they were being supplied to the London trade. Um, 
so it's quite diverse ways and skill um kind of ways you could come into the industry from these sort of our famous uh, we call it the golden age of english watchmaking these golden age watchmakers in london through to uh, yeah apprentices and, and tool makers incredible tool makers in the north of england yeah that that fascinated me that you know as you as you mentioned you know you had mudge who was this sort of genius and came up with you know all sorts of astonishing inventions to to push forward the progress of timekeeping in terms of accuracy in terms of how things worked and so on and so forth um and then you had sort of people good with their hands who even if they did not understand the larger questions they were still able to make precision parts by hand and so they then do that and they go off to london you know the pieces go to London where they're assembled. So, you know, yeah, it was a really, it must have been a fascinating and remarkable time in terms of watchmaking because, you know, you've got some folks who understand the connections to science. They understand physics. They understand, you know, the idea of friction. You know, your your point about, about Mudge's escapement was when he creates it, he figures out how to remove friction from the equation because over time that's going to warp an escapement and that's going to affect the accuracy of your time mm-hmm. and then you've got you know illiterate but a remarkable craftspeople who if you were to talk to them about um you know the, the, the concept of time or physics or any kind of equation you know they just look at you funny you know what are you talking about you know this is totally outside of my experience but they have the hand skills and they have the finesse to create beautiful individual pieces that are part of mechanical works that are going to contribute to the accuracy because they're made so beautifully. Yeah. So so that was a particularly interesting, interesting moment. Um, You mentioned, and I'm going to destroy his name, unfortunately, is it Breguet or? Breguet. Abraham Louis Breguet. Yeah. Um, He becomes, uh, you know, as, as you were writing in your book that he is a hugely important person in in the history of watchmaking accuracy inventions and so on so i'll be quiet and please do tell us more about him <laughs> yeah i mean it it is cliche to say if you're a watchmaker that brego is one of your favorite makers because he is he is this bastion of the, the field he was um an extraordinary character and i mean he he's responsible for the most kind of invention of technological technological innovations within within watches and clocks that are quite many of them still in use um to this day in various forms um but he's he's just he's just a fascinating person so he worked uh he was um from geneva originally ended up living in paris um worked in the run-up to the french revolution um Louis made a famous uh, watch for Marie Antoinette that didn't end up being completed until after, well, several decades after she'd um, met her end. <laughs> um, ended up having to flee um, during the French Revolution um, for obvious reasons. He worked with the aristocracy and had a very lot of very wealthy friends. Um, he was so famous that he um, was also working for um, the British court. He made watches for. Um, King George and Queen Charlotte. He made a watch for uh, the Duke of Wellington. Um, and after the revolution had settled down, he was so brilliant, he was actually invited back and ended up making watches for Napoleon. So this is, I mean, a level of political upheaval and war and um, it, it, it's like a level that is unimaginable in contemporary Europe and he survived and navigated all of this, making work for all sides. He was so brilliant that people couldn't turn him away. I mean, the reality is it's quite possible he was the unofficial timekeeper at Waterloo. So (laughs) it's, um, yeah, just amazing. Yeah. There's there's that great scene in the movie where everyone's looking at their watches, isn't uh, there? sort of... (laughs) So we'll we'll start at twelve, and everyone's just staring, and it goes around. All the officers are all staring at their pocket watches. <laughs> <laughs> all sponsored by the same Swiss watchmaker. <laughs> Something that would have been unthinkable, you know, during earlier battles periods before that. You know, there was mm. the such thing as you know, you, you think of the cliche synchronized watches, right? Mm. You know, mm. so at this point. 
because of his brilliance, they could do that. Um, and you do you do go on to talk about the importance of time, particularly in, you know, not just for, uh, we were talking earlier about the importance for the Navy, but mm-hmm. just in general, you know, unfortunately, accuracy of time is an issue on the battlefield. Yes. And this, this also becomes a really important part of timekeeping. And so on. can you tell us a little bit about the role of more accurate time, how, you know, how this makes its way to the battlefield? Because there are, there are a number of questions, not just strategic questions about keeping time, but the ability to have something that's going to survive in those conditions and continue mm-hmm. to keep time is, is rather astonishing. Yeah, I mean, you particularly see it by the time you get to the Boer Wars and then First and Second World War. Um, and that's when the watch really comes into its own as a utility tool. Um, because even kind of by the end of Breguet's watch, he was so famous in his day, his watches were still very expensive. So it would only have been ranking officers and the likes of Napoleon and Wellington that would have been able to access his watches. Um, but he did make advancements, uh, early advancements into the durability, improving durability too, one of which being the shock setting, which he mm. called the parachutes. Um, he was around in Paris at the time when parachutes were first being tested and, and trialed, so he'd have been very aware of um, what uh, they were capable of. And he um, developed a system whereby um, if a watch was dropped or not, um, it would allow the balance um, staff, so this is the bit that oscillates, is on the staff. And the, the pivots of that staff are less than a millimetre in thickness. So it's so tiny and hard and steel, very brittle. Um, and if you drop to watch it, it's a very common thing to break for obvious reasons. Um, so he developed this parachute system, shock system, that meant that if the watch was dropped, the whole balance would be allowed to bounce and protect the pivots, which... Um, I mean, it's nothing like the modern systems that we use, but it's a huge step forward in its day of improving durability. We're also looking at times where if, if, you know, the client's in Australia and Bergo's in Paris and um, they drop their watch, that's a long time on a ship going all the way back to Paris, being repaired and being shipped all the way back out again. Um, It's another thing we take for granted today of how easy it is to just post things back and get them fixed. (laughs) Yeah, that was a that that was um, that fascinated me. And something begins to happen, though. Um, you know, England is you you write about how England becomes for a very significant period of time sort of the premier watchmakers in in the world. The English craftsmanship, the way that English watchmakers are trained. You talked about the lengthy apprenticeship period. And, you know, learning all the fine skills and you, and early on in your book, you talk a little bit about your own training as a way to, to help the reader understand the, the painstaking and careful and deafness that you need with your fingers and patience in order to not just make the watch, but you actually have to create often your own tools in order to make them. But, but you talked about how something begins to happen in the 19th century that is going to really change, uh, not just make watches more accessible to the common person, but it's going to shift the whole way that watches are made. And unfortunately, kind of catastrophically, you know, um, mean that, that Britain is going to lose its, its status as premier watchmaker. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, the subject of the the process for the democratisation of portable timekeeping is one I found so fascinating. The first example I came across of these watches that, um, yeah, I came across it at an auction house that ended up inspiring my PhD. Mm. So um, it starts with fakes and forgeries. Mm. Um, so you right. see them start to appear in the mid-18th century, um, and they're called Dutch forgeries because... They are quite aesthetically Dutch in their style. Um, They're signed with London makers that quite often don't exist. They're completely fictitious names, pseudonyms. We don't know who's behind them. Um, But they were believed to have been made on the Swiss-French border. Mm -hmm. So you you can imagine when I first came across one of these by a guy called John Wilter, and I looked him up in the dictionary, our dictionary makers, and it just said perhaps a fictitious name. 
And then mm. I found out this whole thing about Dutch style made in Geneva, London, fictitious. I'm just like, what? This, not, this makes no sense to me whatsoever. I have to get to the bottom of this. And um, yeah, 15 years later, I'm still <laughs> researching <laughs> it. But yeah, it's a, right. it was a start of the process of um, making watches more affordable. So this is kind of very early on the coming out of the Enlightenment going into the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it's starting to become possible to make things more quickly and more cost effectively. And um, the really interesting part of this for me as a historian, not so much as an English watchmaker, is um, it's one of the few parts of the Industrial Revolution that the UK lags behind the rest of the continent on industrialization. Um, and it was really achieved in watchmaking through something initially called the etablissage method, which was where watchmakers in London um, were outsourcing a lot of their work or working between creative clusters. So they'd have their case maker down the road, the dial maker somewhere else. They'd have someone else making screws for them, someone making chains, someone making springs. And they'd run around between workshops to bring the various niche skill sets together and, yeah. and build the watch themselves. And in a tablissage, you had these manufacturers set up by merchants who were, instead of kind of going out and networking to get all this stuff, they brought everyone under one roof. So purely through the redistribution of labor, they brought together the, the screw makers, the spring makers, the plate makers, sat them in like a production line effectively and made everything in one go. And that method was so um, successful that you had the busiest London workshops and making a few thousand watches a year. And yet by the end of the 18th century, you have a single manufactory in, on the Swiss-French border who were making 40,000 watches a year wow. for export alone. Nice. So yeah. it's a huge step up. It, it's still tiny numbers in, in terms of mass production as we think of it today, but of its era, this was the perfection of non-standardised mass production. Um, mm. The watches, these Dutch forges that came out of it, um, I mean, they kept... They, they were all right timekeepers. They weren't fantastic, but they, they did the job. Um, they were still relatively expensive. So the, the sort of thing that people could have afforded with a, a farmer who's had a good harvest or a bit of inheritance. So, you know, if you, the, you've had a good um, haul fishing, or so you, that, that's the sort of level. So you had to have a bit of a windfall to get it, but you could still afford it. More people could afford it now. Um, and then it's over the next century you see the perfection of standardised mass production. And this was the first time you could get your case made in England and your movement made in the US and put the two together and the two things would fit perfectly. Um, mm. That was perfected over the next century um, in the USA um, by the likes of companies like Wolfram, Elgin, and Hamilton. Right. Um, and you ended up with the dollar watch. And that was the, the moment that anyone, it was the average worker's day wage at the time, anyone could afford a watch, kids could afford watches. Um, that was the point that watches became accessible to absolutely everyone. And with that, our personal portable time became accessible to everyone. Because you, you talk a little bit, and I don't want to, I don't want to carry them backwards, but um, because you, you did spend a fair bit of time on it in the book, no pun intended, is... <laughs> idea that you yourself as a person could tell time meant you could manage your own time and I was mm. fascinated by before the dollar watch as things are being mechanized but the dollar watch still hasn't reached the populace yet is the control especially in England which is the first industrialized country the control that management has over labor because they control the time and so as you become a wage worker, as you have to show up at a manufactory and you're getting paid a certain amount, depending upon how long you're working, how management can fool with that and they can mm -hmm. change the clocks. Or the, if you have a, a watch, you know, or a, something, they'll take it away from you and you get in trouble because they actually don't want you to know how long you're working. And I found that to be simultaneously just astonishing and then of course well of, of course you know because the whole idea of how much time you devote to labor and how much you yourself can keep track of your own time mm. becomes fundamental to 
to freedom, to labor, to being paid properly, having leisure time and so on and so forth. So so that was a fascinating aspect. So I assume then that when the dollar watch, and I assume it was you know called something else in England, clearly, when that becomes available to the working classes, things things change rather dramatically, don't they? Because again, because of this wonderful technology that that mechanization and industrialization has made available to the very people who actually might be making it. Yeah, I mean, it's for me coming up the history as a watchmaker. I always start with watches and then look for the history that kind of is going yeah. on at the same time as them. And this is the really fascinating thing is you can see the changes in these production in the production of watches. You can see that more of them are being made. And then you can look to the archival accounts and see um, the the complaints of factory workers for having their watches confiscated because they told people the time of day after the factory master was trying to put the clocks back and forth. Yep. Um, people being sacked as well for for kind of taking ownership of their own time. You can you can see the two things just fitting alongside each other perfectly. Um, yeah, it's um, yeah. I think particularly for kind of personal trade and travel as well, it, it was a liberating thing for people to have access to. You no longer had to be in kind of proximity to a public clock to to um, have he, be able to hear the time. Um, and that would have been good for people kind of getting out and about, trading, working further afield, um, and also travel. So you've got the railroads as well. It's a, a hugely important advancement going on at the same time as all of this. So people traveling cross country and, and kind of the world getting smaller, as you will. You no longer have to wait for a letter to go on stage coach for three weeks to someone wait for them to apply in three weeks back again. You can kind of we've got telegrams and trains and things. And it's, yeah, everything is speeding up. Again, mm -hmm. it's this kind of technology speeding up. Our pace of life is speeding up. And then having this kind of more and more access to accurate time as things speed up you kind of see the, the work-life balance slowly um, grinding into this non-existent void that we have today. Um, and the watch follows us through it. But it's kind of something that we've invented to keep the, our cultural concept of time rather than something to regulate us. And yet we allow it to regulate us more and more as time goes on. Absolutely. I mean, there was a, a period a while back my, my watch trap had broken and so I was reliant on my mobile for the phone to, for the time and my battery died and there was nothing worse than walking around going, I have absolutely no idea what time it is and where I'm supposed to be. I don't know when the buses are, I don't know what time the train is. Listen to the clocks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, now think about it like we're on Zoom now. We're on an international call. How on earth would you plan something like that without access to, to digital time? I mean, it'd be impossible. Trade as we know it. Our working lives as we know them would not be possible without the sort of time access that we have today. Yeah, well, uh, every now and then we've uh, we, we've had a couple of humorous history hack uh, time <laughs> delays where um, the, the prime example I can think of was the other day because um, Alina's in Warsaw. So she's an hour ahead and um, she messaged me, said, I'm not going to be able to make the 10 o'clock. And I was like, that's OK, because it's not till 11 because you're an hour ahead. And it wasn't until um, I got a, a text message from the person I was interviewing saying, I'm ready when you are. I'm like, oh, yeah, English time. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so occasionally it goes wrong. <laughs> and, and I'm forever I'm forever having to make sure because English time changes at a different date than USA time. So typically we're five hours different and I can count on that and I can keep track of that. But there's a period of time where we're four hours different. And I always have to check with my British colleagues and make sure so that I'm not, you know, arriving late or early and, you know, screwing things up. So, yeah, as much as we try to manage time, as much as we have, um, you know, various means of calculating it, typically digital, there are just times when yeah. human beings, we, we are overwhelmed by um you know, trying to manage our own time. Yeah. And now we only have 24 time zones. So you go back again oh, to the yes. uh, 19th century in the US alone, there were hundreds of time zones. So it's all local time rather than our kind of 
degrees of separation that we use now. I was yeah. stunned by that fact mm. when I read it in your book. I knew we had a lot of time zones. I, I knew, you know, because we've 3,000 miles from sort of one eastern seaboard to the western seaboard and that obviously does not include hawaii which is you know well out in the pacific ocean and i thought 183 how did anyone ever meet together if they were not living in the same town basically you know yeah. and how did they that that shocked me how late it was before we actually settled and before the the huge meeting in greenwich the international meeting where, you know, various important figures sat down and said, right, we, we need to settle on, we need to agree because this is not going to work, you know, unless we can all agree that there are standardized times within particular areas, you know, it, it's not possible to function as, you know, governments, it's not possible to function with trade, it's not possible to function industrial processes if we can't come to some agreement about what time it actually is. Yeah. It's not Which, uh, talking of time, this uh, feels like quite a quite an opportune moment to, to wrap it up because I have to go and put my boys to bed. They're currently destroying my living room. So, <laughs> but, um, um, but Rebecca, this has been really, really interesting. I feel bad cutting it short, but um, could you just remind everyone the, the, the title of your book, um, when it's due out and um, where they can get it from? Sure. So my book's called Hands of Time. It's a watchmaker's history of time. It's out on the 27th of April in the UK and 13th of June in the US. Um, you can buy it at, I think, all good retailers. <laughs> so Amazon, bookshop.org, Waterstones. We'll get it for the History Hack um, book on uh, bookstore.org uh, website. So uh, we'll get a tiny slice of the money. You get a larger slice of the money and Jeff Bezos can't use it for evil or allegedly or whatever they're using it for these days yeah, I'm you can cut the Amazon one keep it out of this. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca thank you so much as I said this is a it's a cracking good read I highly recommend it to all of our listeners um it it really is in addition to being chock full of great information it's it's it is a it, it's a real grabber. Um, you know, it, it does pull you in and you absolutely, as a reader, want to know what happens next. And I really enjoyed how much you weaved of your own personal experience training as a watchmaker uh, and how you, you work yourself um, lent a, a, a personal aspect to it that made it, made it um, uh, not only entertaining, but also uh, allowed me to understand the processes much better not being a very mechanical person myself. So thank you again very much. It's thank been you. Like thank you. Yeah, it's been really good. Thank you so much. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.